Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Wagner Johnson. I'm the head of the Biomedical and Translational Sciences Department for those who don't know me. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cohen Vadix. Uh, he's the director of orthopedic research at Arthrex, which is located in Naples. Um, and this is a company that's a pioneer in the field of arthroscopy and minim minimally evasive uh, orthopedics. Um, he leads a global team of specialization in the field of biomechanics, biomaterials, and clinical research. And his team currently supports more than 300 ongoing research uh, initiatives. So Arthrex is very, very active in uh, orthopedics research. And he holds a BS degree from Colorado State University, a master's from Rush University Graduate College, and a doctoral degree from University of Oslo. Uh, and he's very accomplished in terms of his scientific publications and, and has presented this work uh, from Arthrex at national and international meetings. So without uh, further delay, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, it's a true honor to be here and speak to you. I'm sad that we can't do this in person. I'm looking forward to, to, to doing this soon in person, perhaps next year, the year after. And um, coming back to Chicago is, um, is, a, is a true joy. So again, um, my name is Cohen Vadix. I'm the director of orthopedic uh, research and kind of, this is my background, it's, it's academic background. Um, I did my undergraduate at, at Colorado State University, as was mentioned, and then my undergraduate research was at the Mayo Clinic. And that, that was mainly focused on tissue engineering and orthopedic science. And I took that knowledge over to Rush University is a two year program. The first year was medical school. And then the second year was thesis based, which was, you know, like, you know, truly um, inspiring as well. But I, I, I ultimately wanted to go do a, a PhD. So I went to University of Minnesota. They had a collaboration with the University of Oslo. And that's where I did my doctoral work um, on orthopedic sp sports medicine. From where I was recruited to start up a lab at the STEMI clinic in Vail, Colorado. So STEMI clinic is one of the top places for sports medicine fellowship. So it's Andrews, uh, Curl and Job in California, and then STEMI clinic are the top sports medicine fellowships um, in the United States. So I was there for five years as director of biomedical engineering. I did a lot of work in collaboration with Arthrex as well. We did a lot of product testing. And then I'm also now doing my executive MBA with Quantic. Um, so th again, here are some, some, some examples of what I did at uh, both the University of Minnesota and at the STEMI clinic uh, during my work there. So my postdoctoral work was at the STEMI clinic and um, we did a lot of these product testing for, the, for, um, for Arthrex. So here's the adjustable loop device. We did a screw here, which is no longer on the market. Actually, this is a very early generation of one device for, for ACL and PCL reconstruction. Uh, this is a clavicle. And so it was a really nice intro into device testing, but then also being able to publish that. So ultimately they, they offered me a job, um, Arthrex did to work for Arthrex, um, but not in their US headquarters. It was actually in Munich, Germany which is where the European headquarters is. So that was six and a half years ago. Uh, it feels much shorter, but you know, when I look at the calendar, that is six and a half years ago. And um, this is the European headquarters. So we flew out there, uh, my wife and I, um, and when I saw this building, this was the Google of orthopedics. Um, they have a, what's called a surgeon lounge here where we meet with, with surgeons. Uh, we also have a cafeteria here as well. So it was all inclusive. So it was a one-stop shop with regards to medical education research as well. This is the inside of the, the building. It's the surgical skills lab. So these are all mini operating rooms. So you have numerous of them. I think there were 30 at the time, uh, or 38, I believe. Uh, I took a few of them away for my research um, team. So you'll see that in a little bit. <clears throat> but this was a great educational facility, right? To be able to utilize this on um, uh, cadaveric uh, specimen surgical training, uh, you know, prior to trying these procedures out in the uh, clinical setting. So here, again, I took out a few of these towers. So I think there were 38, now there's 36. Um, and this is where we built our research area right there within the surgical skills lab. 
At the time, I had two employees. Um, one was an engineer and the other one was a clinical specialist. And now our team consists of 40 employees. And a year ago, or, sorry, a year and a half ago, I moved back to the United States to the global headquarters in Naples, Florida, with the, the, the primary focus and the purpose to build a, a global team. Uh, this was also aligned with the expansion of the global campus. So the European campus had a brand new renovation and then the European campus, or so then the, the, the global campus in, in Naples was the, the next version of that. Um, it allowed me to, to work more with global surgeon collaborations, including APAC, the Asia Pacific region, which was also recently launched in Singapore. Uh, we have now global research initiatives and then global resources based on skills and expertise. <clears throat> What I mean by that is we have truly phenomenal engineers in Germany, um, and then we have you know truly phenomenal clinical specialists here in the United States, and that having that you know collaboration is, is very impactful. Here are the advanced research facilities that we've had or have currently in Munich, Germany, and then also here in Naples, Florida. We, we were just approved for a million dollar expansion of the Naples, Florida research lab, so you'll be seeing that update. I think what's very important is the transparency. So here you can see the safety line here. We also have a safety line here in the Naples headquarters and surgeons, if they're training here in the lab, you can see them here training, they can walk over and talk to our engineers and ask them any question that they have. And I think that's truly unique for our company. We are a private company. We're not on the stock market and we have a single owner, but from a private company perspective, we're extremely public. We have advanced tools and techniques. Uh, so again, we are regulated by numerous governmental agencies. So we have to have the latest and greatest in this regard. And we also have established quality standards. Again, we are audited and we do have certifications for both FDA and, and BSI audits for CE marking. So we have to have the latest software and technology. Um, and then what's also really unique for us um, is that we have access to, to professional resources. So here you have a surgeon doing ACL reconstruction right within the machine, um, which is pretty unique because you know, typically we'd have an engineer you know, doing that procedure. Here you have the ability to tell the journal and the, the reviewers that this is a orthopedic surgeon doing the actual reconstruction and not an engineer doing it. It, tr it truly elevates it. So the purpose of our department is to provide timely scientific evidence of innovative technologies and novel approaches of surgical treatments that will help surgeons treat their patients better. We have three core tenants within our division, it's biomechanics, biomaterials, and clinical outcomes. And these all drive our mission of helping surgeons treat their patients better. We focus on timely scientific evidence, and I'm gonna to talk today about both the verification, validation, feasibility, of course, the product release, like what we've done with regards to a, the scientific evidence surrounding a product release, and then post-market surveillance. This is basically the, the clinical outcomes. As mentioned, we are supporting numerous studies, both internally and externally. Uh, for internal studies, we do a lot of biomechanical testing, um, such as these types of studies. We have 462 test reports in 2020. We're actually, this is a record year in 2020, despite the, the, the current pandemic, uh, where we have simple tests you know, to look at the implant, um, tension and the force as well. <clears throat> so this kind of goes into my lecture now with regards to identifying the innovative technologies and novel approaches to surgical treatments. And that's gonna be the, the primary focus today is talking about what are some concepts that we're looking at and how do we approach it? And so we look at technology principles in, in a few different ways. We always look at a defined clinical need. Again, it goes back to our mission, right? Helping surgeons treat their patients better. It's about surgeons and their patients. It can be equivalent to an existing treatment. It can be an improvement to an existing treatment or our favorite, it's a new solution to an existing problem. So here's a problem that's been identified in that 42% of patients who underwent the Brosum repair were unable to return to pre-injury level of activity. And this was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. It's a nine-year follow-up uh, study. And the Brosum technique is, is basically the repair of the lateral ankle structures. So a, a twisted ankle that's repaired with the Brostrum is then 
not sufficient in 42% of patients. So that's an existing problem. <clears throat> we tested this biomechanically um, and we, we validated this as well. You can see the Brostrom technique and looking at different options. So maybe it wasn't necessarily the repair, maybe it was like, maybe we can improve it. And you can see the ultimate load here, and this is the native structure. You always wanna go back to the native structure. And that's kind of the theme in the talk here as well. And all three repair groups are much weaker than the native um, ligament. It's the anterior talofibrillar uh, ligament. <clears throat> so here is the, the fibula here, the talus. So this, this is the ligament that we're repairing. This is the Brostrom technique with these small sutures. You see the suture anchors. But as I mentioned before, that's not enough. So the concept was an internal brace. Uh, this was a concept that actually came from the United Kingdom. A surgeon had this idea. And the concept was to have an internal check or early mobility, stronger ligament healing, an early re return to activity, and also increased patient satisfaction. So where do we come in, right? So this is an idea from a surgeon while well, we're scientists and we wanna do the biomechanical validation. If there's safety involved, we wanna look at perhaps an animal study to look at the in vivo analysis. We work with our product development team, the engineers to develop a technique um, and the products that are associated with it. We of course are in lockstep with our regulatory team looking at the indications for use or the, the DFU, the directions for use. Surgical technique development. Again, this is the most important thing. This is what really sets Arthrex apart is that we try to make something that's re repeatable so that if a surgeon in the United Kingdom, you know, does a procedure, it's the same in, in um, Chicago, they're able to do the exact same procedure and that's a, um, a very predictable outcome. Next step is always a case series and then ultimately the, the top of the pyramid is always clinical outcomes. And this is evolutionary, right? So this can go at, at back to any stage. So if you're product development, you can go back to biomechanics, et cetera. And it's always you know, the horse leading from a scientific perspective as opposed to clinical practice. Sometimes you see the opposite, but this is our focus always. So here we're able to validate this biomechanically. Again, that's our first step. So you have the intact, that's again our goal. And now you see what happens when you augment it or you, know, you increase it by itself. But what we really like is that you reduce it if you also include the repair. So by itself, the internal brace by itself was actually higher or even stiffer, but we really wanna go into this area here. So that was very reassuring. Then we saw a retrospective study here from University of Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> and this is a surgeon um, focusing on high level uh, patients including University of Minnesota football players. Um, and it was an 81 cohort and it showed that they're able to return to play at an, at an accelerated pace. Recently published in the foot and ankle journal, this is the main journal for this uh, specialty was a prospective level two study. It was blinded and it was randomized. I'm not quite sure why it's level two. In my, in my definition, it would be level one but um, that's currently an open question with the journal that we have, but let's, let's just say it's a level two study, uh, prospective randomized trial showing 4.2 weeks earlier return to the pre-injury level of activity, which was significant. So again, this is the foot and ankle, and we always talk about cross-pollination within our company because we have numerous portfolios. Within orthopedic research, we cover all these portfolios, you know, not just these, but also numerous other ones, such as arthroplasty and spine. So here's the internal brace. It really kind of came from the shoulder when you look at the speed bridge technique. And then this went to distal extremities or DEX as we call it, <clears throat> and also went to knee. And that's gonna be the, the primary focus today is the knee or, or the ACL. I want to um, find a topic that would be mutually beneficial. So here's the ACL. So this is an, an anterior cruciate ligament uh, reconstruction. You can see the PCL here. This is the, the femur. It's uh, the knee is flexed in 90 degrees and here's a tibia fibula <clears throat> and you see a graft. So this is what's called an all inside femoral tunnels, meaning that it's not a trans tibial femoral tunnel. It's drilled just slightly here. And this is a trans tibial uh, tunnel here. When we talk about the ACL, we talk about five different things. 
One is graph fixation. We want to restore the anatomy, augment with, with biologics, fortify the graft during healing and maturation, and treat the residual instability. This spells out graft. And so for this lecture, let's talk about the, the actual components of graft. <clears throat> so let's start with graft fixation. For arthrex, we have numerous technologies to be able to fixate that graft within that knee. A um, big product for us is tightrope. This is a registered trademark. The tightrope is basically here. So it's a button, it's a titanium button with suture that brings in the graft inside the position that's required or desired. On the tibial side, you have what's called a, um, a button here, and you also have uh, different buttons for both the BTB or bone tendon and bone tie rope. And also we have it for the PCL tie rope. <clears throat> so we're gonna be looking at a lot of science, you know, like, like during this lecture, and it's always driven by a question, right? And when we get this question answered, Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there for us. We get more questions. And that's kind of how we progress. And we're very open, right? So when we talk to surgeons, they always have more questions. And <clears throat> sometimes one answer can solve numerous questions, but ultimately we're gonna have to have a study that answers each uh, question. <clears throat> so the first question is, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the effect of screw insertion on the adjustable loop device retentioning? And so the adjustable loop device, again, is a tight rope. That's the generic term for it. So you have, again, the button here, the titanium button. This is an acrylic block. We're able to see how this graft fits within this simulated um, femur. And you want this as tight as possible. You don't want, have, you, you don't want to have any sort of micro motion here. And you can see here, where we insert a um, screw, <clears throat> what happens to this graft? You can see a little bit of a change here. So there's a little bit of a loosening here after you insert the screw. So basically what happens is you have the femoral side complete and now you're putting the screw in to fix the, the surgical procedure. And what is the impact to the patient? Because this is a standard of care. But we noticed that you have a decrease in force, which makes sense because you're reducing that tension here. So you have 50 newtons of tension loss here because you're inserting that screw, it's taking away that tension and you're pushing the, the graft up to the point where this is 62% loss of this pretension. And what that means is it takes about half a millimeter to return to that initial low level. To go from here to here, you need to, um, change it to half a millimeter. And what does that mean clinically? Well, it means that you're gonna have a higher chance of failure because three millimeters is, is, is um, determined to be a clinical failure. <clears throat> Here's a test methodology. So we typically load the ACL to 250 Newtons. That's pretty standard. Uh, 400 Newtons is more aggressive. We have what's called a kind of a pre-cycle. So this is what's happening in the, in the surgical technique. So during the operative uh, procedure, Here's what's happening uh, very early rehab. So post-op rehab, this is probably what's happening rehab. And then ultimately we do a pull to failure to see the ultimate strength. From an engineering perspective, we're very much interested in this area. Surgeons wanna have this data point and this data point. How, how much has it moved? How strong is it? So here's a dynamic elongation. Uh, you can see what happens with the ability to retention. So this is a fixed loop device here. Here's what happens when you don't retention it. And then here's that, res that, that residual laxity that's inherent. And again, you're at a 2.2 millimeters that you're not able to recapture. Again, I said before, the dynamic elongation at three millimeters is a clinical failure. So you're pretty close already. So by being able to retention this adjustable loop device, you're able to restore and go back to a more acceptable level. Again, this is not a, a failure that, that surge or the patients will be able to, to notice. All, the way that these patients would come in that, is that they would say, well, my knee doesn't feel like it should. On MRI, it's going to look fine because it's going to show that the ACL graft is, is remodeling, but ultimately it's going to just have more um, laxity that's, that's present and it gets worse um, that it's not able to be restored. So what is the best construct? So 
um, when we look at the graph link technique, numerous surgeons came up with different constructs. So this is the graph link technique. This is a semitendinosus graph. This is a hamstring, which we uh, regenerate. So we're able to harvest this from the, the patient's same side knee. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but of course, there's numerous graft options available. <clears throat> this is a quadrupled graft preparation. And you can see here how we tested this. So this is a porcine bone and a bovine tendon. And what we, the reason why we use a porcine or pig bone is because it has the same, bone mechan um, the same biomechanical properties as a human um, that's very athletic, a, a typical population that will tear the ACL. It's the same thing for bovine. When we harvest these from a cadaveric specimens, they're much weaker and it doesn't really reapproximate what we want to see in an adult population that's um, typically getting these ACL reconstructions. Again, here we bumped up our, our rehab to 400 newtons. So we go 250 um, newtons, we go from 10 to 250 newtons, and then we go all the way to 400 newtons to really stress the uh, graft. Here's the dynamic elongation. Again, is what I said before, the surgeons want to see the displacement. Here are the three surgeon authors, they all had their unique technique. What we see is that there's no difference you know, between these three surgeons, both on the initial load and then the ultimate load. I'm sorry, the, the, the ultimate elongation. And here's the load here, the ultimate strength. You can see there's no difference. There's a slight increase here, of course, for Wilson. So this is a graph link technique. Uh, again, there's no difference between the suturing mechanism or how you configure it. Uh, it's a single hamstring tendon. It's quadrupled or tripled. It's compact, it's short. Um, it also has no screws in the tunnel, which allows for the remodeling. I'm gonna go into more detail about that. Uh, you're able to retention that that's specific to the patient and it's biomechanically and, and clinically proven. So how do suspensory loop devices compare? So for, for Arthrex, we were the first with the tightrope. And you know, like most industries, you have competitors that come shortly afterwards. So we had numerous competitors that came. They wanted to compete against the tightrope and wanted to you know, take some of that market share as well. But of course, we have patents on our devices. And so they're going to have to go around our devices to be able to enter this market. And we wanted to see what the difference would be fr from these devices. So again, we looked at a, a tibial side um, group where we looked at these different devices. Here's with the screw, here's with the all inside, here's with the screw as well. And then we have a fixed device, meaning it's just a button with a fixed loop. You can see here, <clears throat> uh, looking at the elongation, it's pretty known here. The, the initial elongation was the best for a tie rope and it's pretty standard across the board from a competitive perspective, you know, which is good. Um, and then from the ultimate failure load, you see here um, that the tie rope had the highest ultimate failure load as well. Again, it's due to that cortical fixation. You can see also here from the, the competitor side. So that was fixation. And the next one is really the restoration of anatomy. So how does the graph link into integrating the closed all inside tunnel. So again, here's how a tunnel is prepped. You have something called a flip cutter. It goes through the cortex, it goes inside the joint, and then it flips, and then you pull back. The surgeon will pull back until a certain uh, distance, and then you have a tunnel. And then that tunnel is where the graft goes. And a lot of you know, concerns were, well, what does that tunnel look like? Is that congruent? Does it have more issues? So there's a CT study that confirmed this as well. This is without the flip cutter and actually with, and the, the flip cutter showed to have actually better tunnel diameter as well, or um, a tunnel uh, geometry. <clears throat> we also want to see how it compared to screw integration, the, the bone integration. So here is the suspensory fixation here, and here's with the screw. You can see the threads still of the screw, uh, and you can see where the bone integrates here. And this was published in 2016. What are the clinical outcomes of this technique? This is the GraphLink scientific update. We update this frequently. We have something called the Surgeon app uh, where you can go online and look at technique videos. You can look at scientific evidence. Um, it's great for residents and fellows to be able to see you know, what's happening on, on these techniques. We also have a what's new. It's a new video every day um, to really stay up to speed on, on what's new with regards to sports medicine and orthopedics. And like I said, the, the graph link 
scientific update is now available as well. So you can see both the biomechanical and also the clinical uh, results. And then these links will take you directly to the PubMed article. <clears throat> Here's one example of those articles this is a, a level one randomized controlled trial looking at both um, the graph link versus a full tibial tunnel technique showing significantly less pain with all inside. This is a via the VAS. And then also the uh, clinical outcomes were the same. This is 148 patients. The pain is likely due to the fact that you're not uh, breaching that tibial cortex is what the authors thought. Um, the question that is coming up now, especially in the last five years is, are there alternatives to ACL reconstruction that restore the anatomy? And so here's an ACL tear. There's a patient that came in, um, but you see this really nice ACL that's still there. The tear is here on the femoral side. You still see the vasculature intact. And typically what would happen is the surgeon would come in and they would shave away this ACL that looks like it wants to heal and then put in a reconstruction. And the question is, you know, does this patient have an alternative? And this is a paper, again, this is in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, <clears throat> and the question is, is there a role for internal bracing and repair of the ACL? This is a systematic literature review. And this paper, again, looked at the ACL repair and whether or not it's a viable option in young patients with acute proximal ACL tear. So the indications are very limited. So the question that we had is, does ACL repair restore native properties? Because again, we want to go back to that native state, that pre-injury state. Uh, and of course, the patient wants to be there as well. So we did biomechanical testing, again, looking at ACL repair. So we're keeping the ACL intact. This is, again, a poor sign model. So we're not removing the ACL. We're not reconstructing it. We're keeping it there, hoping it's going to heal. And then we're going to stabilize it with uh, did this internal brace. It's the same thing that we saw before with the ATFL for, for the foot and ankle. Because we know <clears throat> historically that a suture by itself is not going to be sufficient to stabilize this ACL. There have been numerous failures in the 80s. And we want to be able to have the same rehab for the ACL repair. So <clears throat> when we give a patient the option to have an ACL repair, it should not be a, limit, a limiting agent versus a reconstruction. They should have the same expectation for rehab. Again, so we load it to 250 and cycle it. <clears throat> Here is what we created the ACL functional zone. You want to be inside this like, cone. And here's the ACL repair with internal brace, and here's without ACL repair, or with, without internal brace. <clears throat> you can see the over constraint here. Uh, like this is what we're trying to avoid because here you can go into an area called stress shielding, which we haven't observed, but certainly a, con a concern for us. Here it's too loose. Again, here it's likely not going to heal. And look at this displacement as well. We talked about the three millimeters where there's no longer going to be healing that's, that, that's present. Um, here's a quick example of how we do the in-house testing. So we have a protocol, we have data, and then we have a report. Um, sometimes they go into these citations. <clears throat> and so for these types of um, products or indications. So here you have a graph, this, like this came from this report. And the reason I'm showing you this is because we did a similar report uh, here in-house, and we also had a publication with this submitted to the FDA, and this was then approved with the indication as an approved FDA um, technique to be the first um, for, for ACL repair. But like I said, it's not for everyone. So what are the indications? And it's typically a Sherman type one tear. Again, it's a close proximal tear of the ACL. And this study in 2017 showed that 16 patients had this type of tear. It also needs to be an acute tear, right? It, it can't be a chronic tear. <clears throat> so, this is, so this comes directly from our uh, di directions for use or the, the um, DFU. And also, um, yeah, here you see the proximal tear as well is important. And also the, the other variables are age, activity level, and then injury mechanism are also surgical decisions that, that need to be considered by the surgeon. So what are the clinical outcomes for, for ACL repair, right? How do they compare to an ACL reconstruction? I think that's very important to know, especially if you're providing this type of technique. <clears throat> 
So here's one case report that this is also a video. This is a Olympic skier um, from Slovakia. This patient unfortunately tore her ACL proximal tear. It's a very common tear pattern for skiers uh, five months before the um, South Korea Olympics. And the surgeon in uh, Petron saint out of Lyon asked, you know, what can I do? Because if I do an ACL reconstruction, she's not gonna be able to compete. If I do a repair, now I'm able to allow her to go back and rehab and then potentially compete, which she did. And there's a nice video on our website about this success story. Unfortunately, she didn't medal, but she still was able to compete in the Olympics as her last time. Uh, you can see some videos as well. And this is the ALL, the anterior lateral ligament. This is a common uh, supplementary fixation that this surgeon includes as well to stabilize the knee. And I'll go into slightly more detail about that later. So the clinical outcomes are noted again on our scientific update. Uh, we're very focused on science here. And so the clinical outcomes are noted here. There's also a recently publication that looked at 31 cases showing a re-rupture rate of 11.4% which is very reasonable. And that's kind of our, our overall max target, so to speak. You can see that the patients that did fail may not have been the right selection and, and also from a outcome scores perspective. So again, it really emphasizes patient selection, but at least patients now have a choice for, for an, another option. Here you see that same ACL tear with that internal brace. Here's the technique. And then you know, this patient went on to do just fine. That this again allows for preservation of the native uh, proprioception. You're not drilling through the tunnels. You're not drilling through the bone with these large, uh, you know, diameter uh, drill bits, <clears throat> and you're not removing this native ACL. It wants to heal. So, one thing that's very futuristic for us as well and it's very innovative is to augment with biologics. And there's really two updates I have for you. One is something called the fertilized ACL. This is has been coined by the surgeon. Um, you can see the, the control group. Um, the fertilized ACL is basically bone matrix with bone marrow concentrate. And then he puts that inside the actual socket of the ACL before he puts the graft in. This is the control group and this is the fertilized ACL group. You can see the difference in the bone um, remodeling that occurs with the fertilized group. Here are the radiographs. To, to support that as well. So here you see the AP view, tr transtibial tunnel, transtibial tunnel is a lateral view. You can see here to fertilize ACL. You don't see those tunnels. You can see a little bit here, same thing. <clears throat> Again, this is the tight rope device. This is the femoral side. This is the tibial side. There, there, in, th in this case, he's using a full tibial tunnel. Uh, another uh, technique is the bio ACL where they wrap a, uh, the, um, the graft with a synthetic or not, uh, a, a dermal tissue. It's not synthetic. And then put a bone marrow concentrate within the actual graft sleeve here again to support the healing. Um, this is a, a current prospective study that's ongoing to see if we can improve these outcomes. The next one is fortify the graft. So we talked a lot about, about the internal brace. And why does the internal brace matter, especially for ACL reconstruction? And this is an editorial from the Journal of Arthroscopy, looking at the strength and the time as a y-axis. And this is what happens to the ligamentization of the graft that's reconstructed. So there's a necrosis that occurs, and then you have an, the extracellular matrix synthesis, the proliferation phase, and then you have the collagen remodeling, right? And then when do when can you return the patient uh, back or return to play? Um, and that's during the maturation phase, right? Ideally, you want to be at this level, but when is that? And what happens here is the strength goes down during the synthesis. So if it's a small graft, um, already it's going to turn into a weaker graft, and you could have a failure at this uh, point. This could be six months, one year, or the uh, it could be a clinical failure, meaning that the graft st stretches out and basically the patient uh, feels an, um, that's not the same as the other knee. This is also proven in a GOAT model where they look at the allograft and autograft. So the allograft you know, goes through a, a larger remodeling phase 
Uh, from a tensile strength perspective, it's a 74% loss in strength at six months. Um, and then the autograft, so from the, the patient's own body, it's 40% decrease. <clears throat> so what can we learn from this? Again, trying to apply innovative technology. So we talked about the ACL uh, reconstruction. We talked about repair with internal brace. Can we bring these two together and do an ACL reconstruction with internal brace? And who would that apply to? Like, who is the best patient for that? So it could be an ACL revision. You, you really don't want to have a revision. You also don't want to have a secondary revision. And so it could be in that case where you provide the extra support. It could be for graft diameters that are eight millimeters or less that have that weak stability already. It could be for younger patients with these allograft, as I mentioned before, it's a big decrease in strength. And it could also be for non-compliant patients that are simply not listening to the rehab protocol from the, the physician. <clears throat> so the concept was to add this internal brace to the actual tie rope device. You have the graft here and you have the suture tape here. These are two independent structures. They work together, but they're not the, the same. Again, here uh, we focus on the ACL revision to improve clinical outcomes. Uh, we looked at the young patient. There's a 27% uh, failure rate amongst young patients that was published in AGSM and also from non-compliant patients as well. <clears throat> so what is fiber tape? Okay. It's kind of going back to the basics. So fiber tape is a safe material. It's used um, in any material or in any indication for label repair, uh, meniscal repair, meniscal root, it's used to do side-by-side -side suturing for the ACL graft. And here it is here. It's two millimeters in diameter. Uh, uh, yeah, width and then half a millimeter in, in thickness. It's not a metal wire. Uh, so here you have elongation and load. So as you load it, you go up to four millimeters here, approximately at 400 newtons. So it is moving and it is you know, semi-elastic as well. <clears throat> Sorry, I should go back one slide. And it's also biologic, so it does have the ability to uh, take on certain cells. Um, <clears throat> but the question is, what about the joint? Um, does it have a negative impact, especially if we're intraarticular? So this was a study that looked at that, um, where we looked at the side-by-side -side suturing. We also had the incorporation of the fiber tape here, you can see, and there was no change here. We also did a study here to look at the safety profile inside the joint. This is an animal study that we looked at. We wanted to see if there was a change between having it by itself or, or what if it ruptured? So we actually went in and broke it. I wanted to see if this frayed end would create some type of um, you know, cartilage damage or synovitis, which was not the case. <clears throat> so this was a canine safety study that was performed. Does it improve the biomechanical properties? Um, is the main question, right, that we have. Um, so we looked at two concepts. One was ligament augmentation. So this is when you combine the tape with the graft, and we're mainly focusing on this independent fixation, right? So <clears throat> the independent fixation is here. We had a triple graft, which is eight millimeters in diameter, you can see here, or nine millimeters in diameter is the quadruple graft. So ideally, this is where the patient will have a good graft. So this is the ideal scenario. So we weren't really expecting a difference between these two because we know that this is a strong graph and it works well. But we were concerned by adding this to something that works well, can we do harm? And here we knew that maybe this would be impacted because we know that these don't do well, but adding something, what, like what is the impact? Like, does it help? And so again, we did very aggressive um, loading. We did. Um, to 250 and 400 at what we call the, the, um, the early rehab and late rehab and then pull to failure. And we saw a shift. So this is the weak tendon. This is the eight millimeter tendon. This is a nine millimeter tendon. We saw a shift in the loading profile of the ultimate failure load. So again, this is where you want to be. You want to be inside this native ACL. You can see with internal brace for a weak tendon, you're inside the, the ACL. You can see here, even without an internal brace for the nine, they're, they're pretty close, but with internal brace, you're here, but what's very important is that you're not here and over-constrained. This would be a bad thing. Again, here's over-constrained. This is what we're trying to avoid. That's ultimately our, our, our focal point. 
So here you can see the hysteresis curves here of the eight millimeter graphs <clears throat> where we're able to see with the suture tape or fiber tape and here's without. And what some surgeons call this is a seat, a seat belt, right? So the seat belt effect, and that's the native or the independent fixation as well. Again, here you see the nine millimeter graft, not a big deal um, at the without internal brace. You see here the black hysteresis curve, but you can see without the internal brace that once you're loading at a higher load of 400 newtons, that you are starting to leave the ACL functional zone, including the internal brace, and bring you, it brings it back. Of course, surgeons want to see how strong it is, especially orthopedic surgeons. So it's 64% increase in eight millimeter graft and then 40% increase in nine millimeter graft. And I really like this to be able to show how it changes the dynamic structure, right? With regards to stiffness, dynamic elongation, ultimate load and ultimate displacement. And you're really restoring that homeostasis of that native ACL, which is in red. So that's our target. So, <clears throat> These concepts work extremely well um, in a biomechanical setting and also in an animal setting, but can we translate this into a clinical setting is what I said before. Can we have a surgeon in the United Kingdom or Netherlands do the exact same technique as a surgeon in Iowa, for example, and can we create a technique? And that's what we did here in 2016 is we did this early testing here. This is kind of a video that we took from like the iPhone and this is the this is the origins. So we went into a sawbone technique and we tried different ways to, to make it a really simple process. Here's some early slides that we had. This is nothing's changed. This is what we presented to our executive leadership at the time and basically said, this is how we would do it. We would fix in the, the graft and then we would uh, bring it through the tibial side and then lock in the tibial side here. And it's all inside knotless construct. <clears throat> As soon as the surgeon um, left, he, uh, he tried this in a uh, cadaveric specimen. You can see the, uh, the video here. <clears throat> so, here, so here are the steps. You have the fiber tape that's parallel with the graft. You cycle the knee here. This is, a, again, it's a cadaveric specimen. And we're retensioning the tight rope here. And then ultimately you lock it. <clears throat> the graft is always restored, uh, the, the, the final tension. <clears throat> so this surgeon went and did this on a few patients to see how it uh, was, you know, translated as well. Again, focusing on the, the key components of the internal brace. And this kind of brings us to this technology adoption principle. So this is the diffusion of innovation curve, right? When you have innovators or early adopters of new technology. Um, and back in 2015, we were kind of focusing on the innovators uh, with the ACL reconstruction with the internal brace, which is totally fine because I understand the early adopters and early majority, they want to see scientific evidence and they want to see their concerns addressed. And that's what we were focusing on from the last five years. Stress shielding also came up, right? This is a term from the trauma field uh, focusing on Wolf's law, but it also applies to the ligament remodeling. Stress shielding was important for us is like, what? Can we do harm by having an internal brace there by having all the load be seen only by the internal brace and not by the graft itself? The graft wants to see a load. It wants to be able to remodel. So we did an independent study here. where We had the internal brace by itself, and then we had the graft by itself as well. Here we're able to prove that there is a, a primary focus on the soft tissue. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the soft tissue is the primary stabilizer. And then the secondary stabilizer is the internal brace. Here it's proven as well. This is for a very weak graft or seven millimeter graft. And this is a graft that's basically um, uh, going through that remodeling phase where even at low load, it's seeing 100% on the graft. Now you start seeing a little bit higher load. Now the internal brace kicks in, but still a significant amount of load is seen on the graft. It's only until you get to the higher loads, like 400 newtons, when the internal brace really starts to show up and support this remodeling of this graft here. Here you see it again with a bigger graft, not as much of an effect here, which is really good to see. We wanna see 
the load on the graph or like very early on at low loads and higher loads. Here you see it again. Uh, this is the ACL functional zone. This is the augmented and this is the controls groups. And you can see how basically you're not able to go back to an ACL functional zone without the internal brace concept. So this is an editorial from University of Michigan surgeon. This is the surgeon for um, University of Michigan football team <clears throat> saying buckle up surgeons, safety belt, reinforcement of knee ACL reconstruction graphs, and, and basically highlighting the importance of this concept. But again, we're scientists, we want to see clinical outcomes. <clears throat> so we we looked at this study here. This is a study that from uh, Washington, uh, Washington DC area, looking at active patients there. They had 30 patients at two year outcomes. They were able to show um, higher return to, to the pre-injury level and also less pain and, and better patient portal outcomes. It's very early on. This is from that innovator surgeon. That, like this is his patient data that, that he's re reporting. This is, is Dr. Smith. Uh, from University of Missouri, and then this is without internal brace, uh, the world. So we have a outcome system called surgical outcome system where we're able to compare the technical level, which is an activity score compared to the other side as well, and then with and without. He's currently had only one failure after two years, <clears throat> and he's treated numerous uh, patients and numerous graft choices. And this is what he said is his impact to surgeons, right? Again, focusing on the staff. So it's ease of use. There's no change in the normal ACL workflow. It's inexpensive. It's fast. There's no added OR time. And it's reproducible and predictable technique. And some surgeons have said that they sleep better at night. So if they think that they're going to have a small graft size or maybe uh, there could be an allograft risk factor or perhaps a non-compliant patient. And our president and founder said, and this is um, you know, posted in numerous areas around our campus is that surgeons and patients must be able to quantify their trust that techniques, surgical instruments and implants are truly safe and effective. Well, how do we quantify trust? And that's through scientific evidence. And so in the last five years, we've been really focusing on building this pyramid of science on internal brace reconstruction. And that's um, it's also been highlighted in a, a recent article focusing on the 10 components with the questions that surgeons are asking and then the scientific evidence behind it. So here are some anecdotal uh, cases as well. So here you have a patient, this is um, four months out with a quad tendon ACL reconstruction within tunnel brace. So this is a quad tendon that's harvested here. Here's patella, it's a quad tendon. It's been harvested for the graft. <clears throat> this individual um, stepped in the hole and then the but the patient did okay. There was KT-1000, which is the way to be able to look at the anterior drawer. And then on, on the MRI, the, um, the graph was seen in, as intact. Here you can see the swivel lock for the internal brace and you can see kind of a faint uh, a tunnel here. When they did the, um, or when they brought the patient to the OR, they saw the intact graft and then they saw the internal brace here. This is a little bit lax. So the question was, very early on, did we say, save this patient from an ACL reconstruction? Did the internal brace save the graft? Again, this is anecdotal level five evidence. But this was recently published with a similar experience from a surgeon showing that a patient one year post reconstruction had an ACL reconstruction that was still remodeling. You can see the vasculature here that's intact and then the internal brace actually ruptured. So it ruptured here in the middle of the joint on the intraarticular component. And again, this saved the graft. The surgeon then resected the fiber tape and then left the ACL as such. Again, this is kind of where we're at now in the last five years where we're seeing the early adopters are starting to see it as well. And the early majority are starting to see the signs. We are a company. And so we have to, of course, protect our intellectual property um, so we have a patent, uh, actually two patents that have now been filed and approved on this technology. And again, uses that early biomechanical evidence to, to support that. And again, focusing on from a company perspective to the market, uh, we, we kind of classify in, in three different categories. 
It's improvements, modifications, and extensions to the market and new to the company, platform and technology developments. And we basically see these as evolutionary innovations. So things that likely would have happened by themselves, naturally. We're really interested in revolutionary innovations or breakthrough technology, something that basically leapfrogs the evolutionary innovations. And that's really where we think the internal brace comes in. We have a new device that's called the Tightrope 2 um, uh, that, that's coming out. Again, that's patented uh, with the internal brace. That's going to be very easy to use as well. The, the last component is the treat the residual instability. That's the last component of graft. Like that's a T in graft. Um, there's two areas, really. It's the MCL and the, the, the lateral side. Here for the MCL is a recent publication um, focusing on the MCL with suture tape um, reinforcement, again, showing how there's improvements with the MCL, and especially in the ACL reconstructive knee. That's something that we have to focus on. So it's not just about the ACL. It's also about supporting it for the MCL, uh, especially during a valgus load, a valgus rotation. This is, again, I mentioned uh, Dr. Sonny Cote from Lyon, France. He focuses a lot on the ALL. This is the anterior lateral ligament on the lateral side, of course, on the, here's the fibula, um, with an ACL reconstruction located here. This is a two-year outcome showing good results. Again, showing that in this case for him, he always treats his ACLs and then supports the lateral instability. So what's the future? So what are the, like what's the future for technology innovation or what's new and what's next? That's kind of our motto here. Uh, well, we're focusing on PCL. So the ACL, of course, is, oops, is located here. You're, the, the PCL may actually ha have a, a um, more higher impact because these are always uh, translating as well. So this is a publication that we recently did with the Mayo Clinic. Um, focusing on the biomechanics and so next evidence is the clinical, out, the clinical outcomes. We're doing a, a robotic study looking at meniscal repair, again, focusing on meniscal extrusion. We think that's also very important with regards to ACL reconstruction, so we're supporting this study. We're looking at the optimization of this internal brace, so from a tensioning perspective, we have a publication coming out looking at the optimal tensioning of it from an intraoperative perspective, and graft type. So we talked a lot about the semitendinosus here, the hamstring graft or graft link. You also have the BTB, the patella tendon here. And what's new and upcoming is the quad tendon. That's the kind of new graft that we're seeing that surgeons are really, and surgeons and their patients are really um, preferring over BTB and, and over semi T. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to answering any questions and, and going into more detail if you like. Thank you, thank you very much. So we have some questions in here and the rest of the and the rest of the time, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, let me scroll up here to the first one. Would you like me to stop sharing? Is that better? Um, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with is. Okay. Better. Yeah. I'll stop sharing. So the, the first question relates to variability. So, you know, lots of people have anatomic variability and they have bi biomechanical variability in their tissues and related to the, the um, anatomy. So how do the devices that you have accommodate this variability? Yeah, that's a very good question. Again, uh, we, we look at, um, for us, we have a regulatory team within Arthrex that really focuses on variability, especially for different populations like across the world, like different sizes. So our devices are trying to focus on that, a confidence interval of the, of the, of the main population. Um, our devices are adjustable. So in, in the case that I showed today, the tight rope, you're able to adjust that. The fixed loop device initially was a fixed loop device, meaning that it only had 15 millimeters of um, space there that's always fixed. But with the, the adjustable loop device, you're able to kind of bring that back in. Um, as far as the variability with other products, you know, like our trauma plates or screws, there's a lot of equipment that goes into orthopedic surgery. There's a lot of these, our sales force are bringing in a lot of gear and sterilizing a lot of gear for these procedures to be able to accommodate 
um, as much as possible intra-op. We are also doing uh, things with regards to preoperative planning, uh, which is our virtual implant positioning for orthoplasty, where we're taking CTs, looking at sizes, and then um, allowing the surgeon to kind of guess what size um, of an implant that patient would need. But ultimately, we take that into consideration when we design our products of the, the confidence interval for variability. But it's a very good question. <clears throat> Thank you. I needed to, to unmute. So this is a, um, a question from uh, a student. Um, there seems to be a lot of hype around more patient specific orthopedic implants. So like CT scan and then 3D print something that's specific to the patient. Um, how widespread is this? or not, um, and um, has there been any demonstrated clinical advantage? And could this be incorporated into graphs, future graphs, for like ACL, PCL reconstruction? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so I have to break this down into a few different questions here. So the first one is basically the, um, you know, the PSI or patient specific implants. So what we focus on is a little bit different. Um, there are different regulatory um, barriers with PSI because <clears throat> from a, I won't go into too much detail from an FDA perspective, but the FDA will require you know, certain requirements to be met for the product and certain testing. When you start going to PSI, you start bringing in variability from patients specific that may not be tested. So if it's a, if you're looking at um, total shoulder implant that's now customized, it has to go through different regula regulations. <clears throat> so our focus is more about trying to optimize the trajectory of the uh, uh, screws. And that is through CT-based planning. It's the virtual implant positioning where we know that that's where the implant needs to be. The sizing is pretty standardized. And the patient is, is typically you know, uh, very happy from that. As far as scientific evidence for that, there is lots of scientific evidence, which shows that with a um, preoperative planning, that there is an improvement to the surgeon experience and the patient outcomes. And there are publications on that. And of course, there's biomechanics on it because you're able to do that. So the studies that look at yeah, you ask a surgeon, okay, go ahead and put the pin where you think is needed in a glenoid, for example, for that first pin mark, that first drill part. part. That's, that pin basically sets in motion the, the future cascade of that procedure. So that, that's, that first pin placement is very important. And <clears throat> that pin has historically been surgeon specific. So the surgeon said, this is where it is. This is where I've been taught. This is where my mentors have always put it. So with patient um, specific um, planning, we're able to provide the guide that shows exactly where that should, that the pin should be for optimal fixation. And we provide what's called a 3D printed model. It's sterilized. You can have that. It can show the patient, this is your shoulder. This is where that pin is going to be. And this is how your implant will behave. And we've been able to show that it's much more repeatable ultimately, and repeatability is very important from a surgical perspective. The last part of your question was related to ACL. So does it make sense to do that for ACL? Um, <clears throat> maybe for acute stages, yes, or revision. T typically an ACL is very acute, so the ACL is still there. You see where the anatomy is, you see that stump. And so, most surgeons will just take a pin and go right where that stump is, um, or they have different landmarks as well. There's also something called a residence ridge. Um, and then there's also a, um, a different anatomic landmarks where the two bundles of the ACL connect that you can then mark for the tip on, on the femoral side. On the tibial side, um, it's pretty predictable too. You always see an, an, like an ACL that's still intact on the tibial side. So you can just put your guide, your surgical guide right over that and then drill accordingly. In a pediatric setting, it's a little more complicated because you have to worry about that, um, um, the, the cartilage layer. It's, uh, the, it's kind of spacing me right now. The um, growth plate. Um, 
So you want to avoid that growth plane on the femoral side and tibial side. And um, so you have to work a little bit more on making those tunnels uh, going away from, and not crossing that growth plate. So there might be some opportunities there in the future, but then the question is, how often do you need that? So it's definitely the future. We're definitely involved. We're definitely interested. And yeah, if you want to come here and do an internship where we have something for you. So it's great. Great. Thank you. I just want to mention that um, the main part of the talk is complete. So for those who have to leave, but we're going to stick around for about a half an hour for those who want to continue the discussion. And so I'll continue. Um, we have we still have several questions. Um, so I'll continue to to moderate the questions. And um, as long as if you're a student and you have a more specific question, if you want to unmute, that's also fine. Um, but I do have a follow-up question on the question that you just answered. Um, so it does sound like you're doing some patient-specific things because you're using kind of image-guided uh, planning. Um, is the company incorporating either, either related to these procedures or to other procedures, um, are they starting to incorporate AI in any way? Yeah. <clears throat> so we have one guy here. Uh, we're working with Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm looking at that as well. I can't go into too much detail because it's still a development project, but I can say that we are doing AI and we're working with Johns Hopkins on that, um, looking at the HoloLens currently uh, and the HoloLens 2. Um, let's see, what else can I say about that? Mainly we're looking at the shoulder, orthoplasty. That's probably, I've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I want to really encourage the students to engage with you. So I see Linus asked a question. So Linus, do you want to unmute and just ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, I'll, I'll just read it aloud pretty much. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you see robotics having a larger role in orthopedic surgery in the near future? Uh, and in particular, do you think it might provide improvement in outcomes or even like quicker uh, cases, case times, um, being able to provide more precise placement versus like angles and directions when you do kind of put those tunnels in for reconstructive surgeries. Um, and then general surgery and urology come to mind as two fields in particular that have integrated robotics more so into their common practice. Yep. So, um... I think I can't comment for general surgery and neurology. I, I agree. I think it seems like it has a huge, a huge impact there. From what I've seen with regards to the robotic literature and orthopedics, it's right now like primarily for uh, total hip, which we don't have, and then total knee, and also in the shoulder as well, it's coming. Uh, there are some complications that occur with robotics because you are adding more OR time, which then includes to more anesthesia time and then potentially more blood loss. So there are some, some publications on that. Um, there are also some concerns with regards to the conflict of interest with the surgeons that are working with these, the, these robots that need to be considered. Um, <clears throat> so can we improve it? Um, it really depends on what the robot is doing. So again, it's going to be providing those initial cuts, right? The guides for those initial cuts. Are, are there different ways where you can have that from a preoperative planning, right? Can you take that time um, away from the OR and do it more pre-op. So you take a CT scan or an MRI, preferably CT, and you make those cuts ahead of time. And that goes back into the PSI component. So the PSI um, does not use robotics, but it uses these patient-specific implants and cutting guides uh, that are based off of the anatomy. So there's a lot of literature out there. I think it's still very too early to formulate a true opinion. Um, I think we have to be open about it and uh, we have to look at the science. And if you look on our website, you'll see it as well. Um, I would always ask if it was my family member, um, it's whatever the surgeon is most comfortable using, in my opinion. And then as far as the outcomes, it really has to be justified. And I'd want to know why the surgeon is using the robotics and why do they feel like they need to have that um, support during the OR or, do, or like during the surgical procedure. 
Great, thank you. Um, I think there's there were a couple other questions from students in the chat. So yeah, I want- I, I see them now. Yeah, I wanna encourage them to um, introduce themselves and ask their question. And um, then I'll, I can continue moderating if, if, uh, if the students uh, left, if that student left already or um, if they prefer for me to, to do it, I'm happy to do that. But I do wanna give the students a chance. So please unmute and speak up if you, if you're, if you want. And if not, I'll continue. I'll give you a second. Yeah, I just had a, the other question about the, you mentioned the younger patients with the primary ACL repair, uh, like ideal candidates being younger patients. Are there actually like hard and fast clinical guidelines or are you just, um, is it just kind of a judgment call? Um, <clears throat> looking at your question here. So, so yeah, what I meant by that is, yeah, that's a good, that, that's good that you, that, that you point that out. So I think that's more regarding the healing potential of the ACL. So the older the patient, they may not necessarily heal. So there are some studies out there. Um, I mean, there, there's two schools of thought. The first is that the younger patient is more aggressive and will have a higher re-rupture rate. The other school of thought is that a, an older patient uh, may not have the healing potential. And so you may not necessarily be doing the right procedure for them. And the question is, do they need a repair um, or is a reconstruction a more predictable option for them? I think time will tell um, as we push our limits. I think that's just gonna be a natural progression as we go down this ACL repair um, pathway. Cool, thank you. Yeah. So I had a question about your um, that like ideal ACL region because it kind of seemed like that's your like main target that you're trying to hit when actually de designing and testing this product. And I was curious as to like um, what kind of validation work it went into kind of assessing that, and then also kind of related to the last question, if there are perhaps like subregions in there for specific patient populations that you may want to tailor towards a little more, yeah, either through technique or product design. Yeah, that's a good question. So the first, the, the, the first one is, is that validated? Um, it's kind of hard to validate that um, because yeah, there's just so much out there. What that was, it was a combination of numerous publications. I believe it was 11 publications that basically combined the confidence intervals all into one. So that's basically a confidence interval graph. Um, I removed that from the presentation because yeah, I, I, I should have in included it if I knew you were going to be on it, but um, uh, <clears throat> it's it's published in the, uh, the 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 2016 paper, and um, it was accepted as well by the journal, and we've kind of used it ever since. You know, once something's published and you validate it, we kind of use it like moving forward until someone else has something better. Um, the second part of your question, can you go into more detail like within that graph? You know, we haven't done that. Um, certainly that would be of interest, especially with, I believe it was Assad's like, you know, a uh, question of younger populations. Yeah, we could definitely go into more detail um, into subpopulations. That's very much an academic exercise. And our goal is really to kind of cast a broad net. And so that would be certainly like a good, you know, summer project for a student to be able to, to go into more detail and then tease out that data. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Valentino. I actually am a recent graduate and then working in Research Park right now with a prosthetics company. And um, my questions were first, well, two, two way. Um, first, I have a question regarding Arthrex. Do they consult with other companies? Um, and then basically like, it seems like you guys have a lot of um, type of prior experience with animal studies, FDA process, in vivo analysis, that type of things. And right now we're kind of working on a project that will probably hit that stage for the next year. And so we're just kind of wondering do you guys consult with other companies on projects? And if so, how does that process go? 
You mean, are we consultants or do we ask for consulting help? Um, can like if we need to consult with you guys or partner with you guys on something, is that something that would be possible? And then like, how does that process go about? Is that something that Arthrex normally does? Or um, that's a that's above my pay grade. That's probably with our <laughs> legal team to to determine. Um, we currently are not able to consult. Um, it's, a, it's outside of my employee uh, contract, which makes sense. Um, the, the kind of the, it's just a culture thing, you know, it's like if you have enough time to, to consult, then you probably don't, don't, don't have enough, to, you know, like going on a current job. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can certainly recommend like different pro, like, like different um, vendors as well that would be able to answer questions. And certainly I can put you in the right direction of someone that, might be comfortable answering your questions if you have specific questions with regards to regulatory FDA, or they may just kind of give you a um, blank blanket right. uh, statement back, right? That basically says we don't do this. Ha have a nice day. But um, we can certainly try to be collaborative in that. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any specific questions, and then. Um, I can forward it to the, the, the proper person um, if you have specific questions or you can look at our vendors as well um, or our, our collaborators. Like that's typically where we do, like we don't do any animal research here in house. We all, we, we outsource all of that. And we do very little of it to be quite honest with you. The FDA doesn't really require that unless it's a new material or new biologics material, which is very rare for us. Um, it's mainly biomechanics is what we do. Okay. Um, follow up question uh, about fiber tape. So we were kind of part of our project is looking into artificial tendons, trying to make a prosthesis that can be powered by artificial tendons. And so um, is fiber tape kind of analogous to poly tape? And then what kind of cells can proliferate on fiber tape? I know you mentioned that there are cells that can just wondering if it was like tenocytes, what type of cells? And then, like hypothetically speaking, can fiber tape kind of be used to attach into muscle and, and stuff like that? Um, yeah. yeah. So what we've seen in with second look arthroscopy is that the fiber tape does get covered by like different cells. It's just more like a, it's not like really scar tissue, but it's more um, it's not I, I wouldn't say it's not necessarily a, a certain um, group of cells like a osteocytes or, or tenocytes, um, but we do see cells attaching to it. The cells are mainly, you know, mesenchymal stem cells, undifferentiated cells, uh, but we haven't really looked into what they would differentiate into, but we do know that it kind of moves with the tissue. So for a rotator cuff, you put it on top, you, you, you heal your rotator cuff, it kind of brings in uh, with that soft tissue, right? It doesn't, you know, become part of that. It's the same thing with bone. It's always going to have that component there. So it would be somewhat soft still, but then it would kind of integrate like ultimately. Um, I don't know polytape. I don't know what that is or neotape. So um, I, I don't know what material that is. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? Maybe, maybe I can ask a question here too. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, a great overview in, in terms of the, um, you know, what you do at Arthrex. I'm, I'm curious, uh, more from a process point of view, and you talked about sort of this translation, this innovation. I'm, I'm curious for the students, for our college, you know, what, what do you think are the skills that we need to instill or, or train or develop really that, that really will support this type of, of translation, right? From ideas to innovation to, to clinical impact. Um, yeah, I guess um, it's, it's hard for me to say what the ideal one is, but I can, I can tell you kind of based off of my personality, I think it's always being milestone focused. So always try to have a goal in mind and then kind of try to work backwards slightly so like, what's the goal? So we're going through a design study now for, so we just acquired a trauma company. Uh, I got a California and they have a new, they, uh, they have a hip nail, which is probably gonna be the market leader here pretty soon, but it's a startup company. So they're not really well known. So 
we want to do a prospective study on patients with a similar nail, hip nail, a fractured nail. And so we kind of start at the end, like, okay, what do we want to show? We want to show equivalence. Okay, how, what are the outcome scores that, we, that would show equivalence, pain, and then patient portal outcomes, maybe how many injections um, you know, they would have like post-op, and then we kind of work backwards. Um, so that's a three-year study. And I, I would say the most fun of the study or project is to do the project. The hardest part is the planning. And again, that's why I kind of give a disclosure in the beginning, uh, because I'm a big planner. Uh, I'm a big metrics guy. And so um, the more you can do with the planning and really get that figured out, then the rest of the project is going to be just so much more enjoyable as opposed to uh, constantly changing the protocol or constantly seeing the issues. And it kind of goes back to what Valentino said with regards to um, finding consultants, right? Experts in the field are like, what kind of hurdles can be seen? So I think if you're a student, try not to go into it midstream and hope for the best, like really see like, okay, what can I do? What's my goal? What's my timeline look like? What's realistic? And then ask mentors and people that have completed that, you know, if you want a publication, find someone with a publication and ask them what it took to get that. Or if you want an animal study, find someone who did an animal study. And I think that's would be my advice to anyone that's, that wants to, to go into this innovation you know, concept, even if it's someone that wants to develop products, right? That's something that we talked about with the medical school is having students that are very innovative and business oriented, they want to be technology innovators, they want to develop their own products, maybe even have their own startup companies. So um, what does it take to submit a patent? What does it take to secure your patent? These are all foundational steps that are needed. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And, and maybe somewhat, if I can ask a related question. So what do you see, you know, from your perspective, what is truly the fundamental limitation for taking you know, this ACL or orthopedic repair, you know, really to the next level? Is it, is it more about the device design, the bio, you know, the biomechanics of the tissue, which might be inevitable, um, you know, repair or healing mechanisms that can be driven forward, you know, maybe biologically? Um, is it the surgical access? Is it the surgeon skills? Like where, if for our students that wanted to go into this space, if they were to focus on, you know, what's the big impact? What area is the main limitation right now? Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. So I think there's a, an editorial from uh, Dr. John Noseworthy that talks about this, where he says um, that the biggest burden to healthcare is the administrative side in the future, where they're going to be focusing on reimbursements, um, hospital. It's, I've, been, I've been hearing a lot about that in the last couple of months, especially where there's issues with the certain individuals within, within the hospital that are not allowing for innovative technology to come through without scientific evidence, um, which I understand. Uh, totally understand that. And it's the challenge for the company, but also now it's also becoming the challenge for the surgeon to basically say, I want to do innovative technology. My patients deserve this. Now I have to go justify that with my hospital board, which may not have been the case 10, 15 years ago. Um, so, and I also talk to neighbors and friends and I hear that they get different orthopedic procedures done. Um, I get a lot of like recommendations or sorry, like, like questions for recommendations on who to see and what to do. Um, in some cases they already have had the procedure and then I kind of, I'll ask them like, what did you get? You know, like, like, like what was done? And it's always kind of like, I'm trying to keep a, a poker face if I kind of hear what was done or if I see an x-ray um, on what was done and, and what's, you know, um, maybe not as innovative. So I think it's trying to find that balance between being academically minded. So most like a university setting and being innovative, like a private setting, like how can you be both? Um, from that perspective. And I think a lot of that will come from fellowship too and residency by being able to find that fellowship program that matches your style. Are you someone that just wants to go operate 
and you know, I'm, I'm okay with the, the current technology or do you want to push the boundary? That's going to be the question. I could add on to that. Dr. Widjik, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm Cliff Johnson. I'm an in-practice orthopedic hand surgeon here at Carl. I've um, been in practice for 20 years. So had I taken that approach that I'm okay with the standard and stuck with that, I'd be doing a lot of things a lot differently than I do now. So if, full disclosure, I use a lot of Arthrex devices, um, but am a relatively slow adopter of new things. And partially because of what you were just talking about, it's new technology that's developed by a private company in their lab at Naples, bringing doctors down to Naples for a visit to learn the technology. And so it makes it hard sometimes for a guy like me to know who to trust and how to get unbiased information from things that are new and innovative, because those things only come from the private industry and aren't going to be 10 and 15 year trials. So how do you in your company try to mitigate that necessary bias to get the information out to people like me so that I can use your stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. So both myself and we also, I, I'm a director of orthopedic research and myself and also the vice president of medical education is Dr. Chris Adams. Both him and I are not paid um, on how our products perform at all. Not, nothing that I showed today. So we're all salary. Um, and I think it really depends on, you know, from that perspective too, I think that's a big component. So my bonus structure is all fixed. My salary is all fixed. It doesn't matter if one thing does better or worse. Um, so that allows us, especially me, if I find something in the lab that's bad, I'll publish it or I'll, I'll, I'll run it up the, the, the compliance chain. It's no problem. We have the full, full authority to do so. And that's very unique to Arthrex. We're also not within the marketing team. So Different companies have their research and development in their marketing division. And again, we're completely separate. I, I support the marketing team with regards to looking at the indication. So I'm required to make sure that the claims that are made in these advertisements are truly supported by science. Um, and I, I agree. I think the trust, I, I, I totally agree with your approach. I think you should have a um, trust but verify approach and verify everything that a sales individual, whether it's Arthrex or someone else like coming to you, uh, brings to you. And you should feel comfortable with that data because ultimately the patient needs to trust you as well. So mm -hmm. if you're at a point where you're not like by trusting, like the patient is also gonna like, feel that. So the patient will sense if, you know, I I'd rather have a, patient, a surgeon if they're treating, you know, a family member from me and they're using, they're, they're like, hey, Cohen, I know you work for Arthrex. That's great. But I work much better with this in the OR. Like, no offense. I'm like, none offense taken. Like, please do the best you can. And that's my approach. And I think that's the medicine, right? That's, that, that's ultimately what we have to do. Um, again, it doesn't change my day at all as long as that decision is based off of evidence-based medicine. Thanks. That's helpful. And I use all sorts of Arthrex stuff. So yeah, good to see a face that's behind all the internal brace that I put in. Yeah. Well, next time you're in town, you have to let me know. Well, I can show you I've, the lab. I've never been. Okay. It is an impressive tour, I must say. And I think Jessica would, would agree with that. Absolutely. I, I would, um, Cohen, if you could just share a little bit too about how you work with some of the physicians that come down in some of your collaborative spaces. Cause I think that is a, you know, one of the things that we have at universities and especially the university of Illinois, a lot of collaborative interdisciplinary work that goes on. And that was one of the things I thought was really um, impressive. And uh, I don't know whether it's unique or not, but to me, it was very impressive. The collaborative work that you, you do with your surgeons that come down to be trained and have ideas. Yeah, I mean, that's really our founder and president, Ryan Oldsmini. Um, he, is a, it's a private company. He could have retired many years ago, um, but he's here today. He's here every day, grinding. He's on the weekends or we get emails from him. Something's off, he's there. And it's, 
some people don't do well with that type of pressure. I mean, it's a lot of pressure, especially when I was in Germany, he was there all, all the time in the summer. Uh, now he's here, now I'm here. Um, but I love it. Uh, he's so, so detail oriented. And there's a book that talks about the founder's mentality. And I think that's a really good book because it talks about really what that is. Like it's a Steve Jobs, it's the Elon Musk, it's the, the, the Bezos like type of mentality, right? That's just so fierce. And I think ultimately uh, there's so many components to that that are so, um, so worthy to like really take into consideration. But part of that is the collaboration, right? It's the, uh, the ability to really be customer minded and customer oriented. And that's what he does. And he focuses everything here is about when the surgeon walks on this pathway, where, who are they going to interact with? When they're there, where can they sit down and have a conversation? Once they're sitting there, what's around that they can actually work off of, like a whiteboard or, or a, a um, surgical like instrument? It's just truly, I, I haven't seen anything like it, um, to, to be honest. And it's just truly remarkable. And it's just these collaborative spaces. I mean, I think that's really been pressing us as well during COVID is not having that collaboration. I think we'll get there again, um, especially during the conferences. That is the ultimate, um, you know, collaborative experience. And Reinhold loves it too. I mean, he's at there at these conferences. He's always there. He's an ever-present individual, um, and he'll know every detail about every product. And it's just so, so amazing that he is just still so involved in that. And that culture is contagious and we all you know really like focus on that and i think it's the same in the university if you can build that culture um that's the most important thing like build a culture of innovation the mayo clinic is a good example of that too we talked about that where they have the mayo brothers culture is really what they're focusing on has arthrex ever considered setting up an educational foundation parallel to Arthrex like the AO has done for skeletal fixation, but for soft tissue reconstruction? Yeah, we, we, we currently do sponsor fellowships. We sponsor a lot of research studies as well. Um, we, we, we do have a foundation in Germany. Um, it's a compliance issue as well, because now we're sponsoring a society or, and it could be seen as a shell company. And so we're very concerned about having a, a, an, an outside company that would have all the funding from us from a research side or educational side. Uh, instead, what we do is we'll support um, OREF, which is the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation. So we support them. We, of course, support AOSSM. We support the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. So we support all these other societies. Um, there's a price tag, of course, by exhibiting. So it's a big one. So when we go to these exhibits, we also support them that way. So they do have those supports in those regards, and then they in turn support research and education. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'll, I'll leave, I'll pause there just if anybody has any other quick questions. And I just want to say thank you because yeah. it's, it's uh, for for us to have met over a year ago and your, your interest in the college and our students. I'm very appreciative of it. And please, uh, please let everyone there know how much we appreciate your time today. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure. So I really hope we can keep collaborating and figuring out new ways to work together with the, the student population as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice Thanks. weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.